All right, so we are live, everyone. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And of course, there are no classrooms right now. All of you are stuck at home, so we so appreciate you joining us live from all across Canada and the US and on YouTube as we continue to highlight amazing stories of science and exploration. Today, I am particularly excited because we are joined by a new speaker. Joining us live in Calgary is Dr. Michael Maloney, and he has one of the coolest jobs in the entire world. He is a researcher at the Arctic Institute of North America, where he works as an underwater archaeologist. So he gets to explore the story of humanity as told through artifacts and shipwrecks and other things on the deep sea floor. He's undertaken uh, expeditions in Canada, the UK, Sweden, Thailand, and more. And today he's going to talk to us about a very special trip that him and a colleague took in 2018 to discover the first whaling vessel shipwreck in the Arctic. So I'm super excited about this. I hope you guys are just as keen. And without further ado, thank you so, so much for joining us, Dr. Maloney, and take us away. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. It's really exciting. Um, this is uh, obviously kind of new, but uh, but pretty cool. Um, yeah, you uh, you just stole the uh, the first uh, two <laughs> slides that I had on uh, what's going on. So better to have uh, you tell them. It'll be great no matter what. <laughs> yeah, so I'll just uh, I've got a bunch of pictures, a bunch of slides, and we'll talk about it, and then happy to answer any questions. So I'll just uh, get the screen going here. There we go. So. Um, yeah, like Ty, uh, or like Jesse said, um, I was part of an expedition in the uh, uh, in 2018 and 2019 to look for a um, a whaling wreck. Uh, I am an underwater archaeologist, so I uh, I dive to look for history um, and try and figure out uh, what's uh, what things have happened in the past. And and archaeology is really useful because. Um, not everything's written down when we're looking at history. And so uh, with when we look at material records, we can learn things that we can't learn from books, basically. Um, and uh, how did I get into this? Well, uh, like any person my age, it was uh, through a series of movies that uh, you might not be familiar with, but I suggest you check out um, the Indiana Jones movies. And uh, it, they were really entertaining. And uh, I also really, I always loved history, I always loved science, and I didn't know how the two came together. And when I was in university, I figured out that archaeology is where um, you, you can do history and you can do science, and it's a kind of a blend of both of them. So um, that's kind of how, how I got into it. Um, but the, uh, the, the research project that we talk about today uh, starts with whales. So the whales were the original oil trade before oil and gas, uh, you know, especially here in Alberta. Um, it was whaling in the, uh, in the 18th century, 19th century. And um, so it started in Svalbard, which is an island off the coast of Norway. Um, and it moved into the Canadian Arctic and they were hunting the bowhead whale. And it was uh, famous because it had so much uh, oil in it. Um, and it also had, it, it's, a, it's a filter feeder. So it it's a, uses baleen to, um, to feed. And so baleen was actually used in England for co making corsets. So it was really, really big in the fashion industry for this baleen. And so uh, it went on for about 200 years or so in the Canadian Arctic uh, and the whalers would go every single year. So not like the voyages of exploration, the Franklin ships, all that kind of stuff where they would kind of do these little, these little voyages, the whalers went every single year. And so as far as our, our knowledge of the history of contact with the Inuit, um, it's really important because it was very, very consistent. Um, and they would go for the year, they would hunt the whales and then they'd bring them back to, bring the, the oil back to England. Uh, and it basically fueled the industrial rev revolution uh, because uh, it, it oiled all of the mechanics. It allowed for lights. Um, so there was no nightlife before the whaling industry. Uh, and so it's a really interesting period of time. Um, and so a colleague of mine who is a, um, 
a whaling historian, uh, was looking at these historic documents and he was doing it for understanding the, the environmental records that, uh, that were in these documents, in these whaling records. And so he was extracting temperature data and ice flow and that sort of thing. And then he came across this, this uh, record um, that described the wrecking of a ship called the Nova Zembla uh, and that these two other ships that were with it had salvaged uh, uh, parts of the wreck and also saved the crew. So all the crew survived. Um, but this is the document that he found. And he brought it into my office and said, I think I found a shipwreck. And I said, well, you, but you didn't leave the office. Um, and, uh, and so we started doing some investigation. So this is a picture of, of the ship itself. This is the only photograph that we have of the ship. Um, it was made in 1873 in Bremerhaven, Germany. And it sailed as a whaling ship for the Scottish whaling trade uh, out of Dundee, Scotland. Uh, and so what we did was we, we did a lot more investigation into the, the history of the ship. Because everyone survived and made it back to Scotland, we were able to look through all of the newspaper records uh, that, were, that were in Dundee and kind of start piecing things together. Um, so it's kind of, kind of like a, a bit of a, a detective work, kind of taking a whole bunch of different pieces of evidence, putting them all together, and then trying to trying to figure out what's going on. So uh, we were able to fi figure out that it was kind of roughly in this area. So you can see um, I've got a dot down there. Uh, that's where I am in Calgary, and we were looking at somewhere way, way, way up on Baffin Island. So we had a general idea of where, where, where this ship might have wrecked. Um, but the goal was to try and find something more, you know, a, a, a better uh, search location because it's really, really tough to find stuff underwater. Uh, it's even harder to find things in the Arctic. Uh, and so we really wanted to try and tighten up our, our search area as much as we could. So we started piecing together all these lines of evidence. So we had things uh, like, well, we knew that they were on a Northwest heading. Uh, we knew that the winds were from the Northeast. Uh, we knew that they were trying to get into this Harbor. So you can see on the map, this, this area, this fjord was a well-known whaling Harbor. So somewhere where ships could be safe. Uh, and so we knew they were trying to get in there because they, um, they were in a storm. And we plotted all this on a map, but it doesn't make sense because if they're on a northwest heading, um, they would have had to have sailed through Baffin Island. Um, and so we did, we adjusted for what's called magnetic declination. And so when you, the further you go north, the more your compass is going to go off. It's not going to be the right way. And so you have to adjust for that. And so we changed the map and all of a sudden, all the data that we had collected from the uh, newspapers made sense. And so you can see they were going Northwest, trying to get into that Harbor. The winds were coming from the Northeast and pushing them down. And so they wrecked on a reef. Uh, and all of a sudden we had an idea of like, okay, we can, we could kind of pinpoint there's an area um, on this beach that we know uh, from the historical records. So we have an area now where we can kind of search for. Um, and we know that they wrecked on a beach. We know that they wrecked, uh, approximately 300 yards offshore. Um, we know that they had to row, um, about six nautical miles around the point to get to the other ships who had made it into the Harbor, um, to be rescued. And so with all of this data, with all of this information, we can kind of pinpoint a specific area. And so we ended up going out um, and we, we were on a cruise ship and we were given seven hours. So we were on a cruise ship, they got us up there and they said, yeah, if you go out at four in the morning before any of the passengers wake up, um, we'll, we'll let you take a, a Zodiac out and uh, you can go search for this ship. So we had a very, very finite timeline to try and look for this. Um, and so this is what it looked like on the day. Um, it wasn't, uh, 
it wasn't a calm day. Uh, it wasn't very nice. It was pretty uh, not great seas, not very nice day. And so we got out on the Zodiac and we, uh, we started doing our search. And so this is kind of what it looks like uh, when you're out doing your search. Um, and it's, it, it ends up being quite unpleasant. Um, and so there's a, there's a sonar there that we're using uh, at the front of the, uh, the Zodiac. And that's what we're trying to look on the sea floor for this ship. Um, I'm not very happy, obviously. Um, and uh, my colleague who was with me uh, got hypothermia, uh, but he was saved by these polar bear pants that uh, we were uh, given by our uh, Inuit uh, boat driver. So thankfully he was had these polar bear pants with him. And uh, despite all of the fancy mech and Arcteryx and, you know, fancy gear that we were wearing uh it was still the polar bear pants that were the warmest thing for him to wear and that that uh that saved him really so um that was pretty good uh and what we ended up finding was uh we couldn't get onto the beach but we had a drone uh and we were able to find a whole bunch of pieces of timber on the beach from the ship and when you find wood in the arctic uh, trees don't grow. And so anytime you find wood, it had to have come from something. And you can see we've got lots of ship shaped timbers, uh, lots of iron rivets. And so it was just incredible that we had done all this investigation historically. And then we went and looked in the area where we thought something might be, and it was there. Uh, and that was in 2018. And we also did some underwater survey to try and find um, some of the, the materials that might have been submerged. So this is this is called an ROV, so a remote operated vehicle. It's kind of like a submarine, um, but without anyone in it. Uh, and it's got a camera, and it had a, uh, a the thing on top of it. There is a is a sonar device, and so we deployed that. That's um, Ted Earnick, our, our uh, Inuit uh, driver. For the zodiac um and so we deployed that to look underwater to see if we could find anything and this is this is what it looks like uh when we're doing the underwater survey um and so this is the footage from the rov and so you kind of drive it around um just like a like a drone um and then we we weren't able to determine whether or not uh, there was any materials, but we had several anomalies. So you can, if you have a look, the thing that you look for when you're looking underwater is anything that's straight lines, uh, perfect circles, uh, right angles, anything that's non-natural, that's what you're looking for. And we did identify an anomaly right here. You can see that this kind of, looks like what is probably the anchor of the ship. Um, and so we didn't identify any of the ship remains necessarily, but we did find uh, what we believe to be portions of the ship underwater. So that was, that was the seven hours, um, the whole survey. And uh, that's all we were able to do. So in 2019, we went back um, on board a ship called the Nulialuk which is a um, Nunavut uh, government vessel that does mostly kind of fisheries surveys, but they gave us a couple of berths to be able to be on board and sail past our site. And so this is what it looks like on a nice day. Um, so previously we were there on a pretty bad day, but as you can see, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a pretty beautiful area. Um, so this is high Arctic Baffin Island, and this is the ship we were on. And so we had, um, we only had two days because of the weather, um, but we were able to get on shore and, um, it's, it's a hard area to get to. You can see all the rocks. Um, the Zodiac can't really land us in really tight. Um, and so it's tough, but once we got on shore, it was just absolutely incredible. There was more material than we could have imagined from the previous survey when we just got over it with the drone. 
And so um, you can see here, I'm, I'm, I'm excavating a portion of the ship that's washed on shore. You can see all the materials that are spread across the beach. Uh, we had large mass timbers with paint still on them, uh, which is really important because we don't really have historic records for those sorts of things. Um, and, you know, not uh, unlike the, the British Royal Navy, uh, where there's lots of documents, there's not a lot of documents for the whaling history. And so we don't even know what these ships look like. Uh, and so finding this sort of thing is really, really important. We can actually sample this paint, figure out how they were, uh, how they were painted, large mass timbers, so we could figure out how they were equipped, how they were rigged, um, which again, there's no historic records for those things. And so finding these material evidences is, is, is really useful. Um, yeah, lots of pieces of mast, um, lots of pieces of boat, uh, blocks and tackles. So these are things that would have been used for rigging the ship. Uh, and this is a, uh, on the right hand side, there's a yard arm, which would have been part of the part of the mast structure for the sails. Uh, and then pieces of the ship's boat. Uh, so the boats that would have been launched to, um, to go get the whales, we don't have evidence for how they were constructed, what they looked like. Uh, we have some from the States um, at the uh, Bedford Museum in, in outside of uh, Boston, but we don't, we don't have any from, from a British context. So this shows us how the sailing boats were constructed, how the whaling boats that would go out and actually catch the whales were constructed and actually how they were painted because we have paint um, on, on there as well. Uh, and ornamentation. So we always know that naval vessels generally uh, had figureheads. They had lots of superstitious lore about them. Um, they were ornamented in a way that would be uh, they would tell a story. But the whaling boats were just, um, you know, it was kind of like a, a, a freight truck here, right? Like you just see cargo trucks going by all the time and maybe they've got a name on them and, and that's about it. Uh, and so we don't know about how these things were ornamented. And we actually learned a lot that they were actually decorated quite, quite well. And so one of the goals that we'll have will be to scan these and try and reconstruct uh, what this ornamentation would have looked like. Um, and we found barrels. This helps confirm the date you can see. So this is a, a rubbing that we did with a, a patent date of uh, June 3rd, 1902. Uh, the ship wrecked in 1902. Um, but uh, one of the things that's interesting about this is the ship set sail from England in April um, and this, of 1902. And this has a patent date of June 3rd, 1902. So we're not really sure how this got here. Where did they pick this up? Uh, did they meet an American ship? Did they stop in um, St. John's, which they sometimes did on the way up? Uh, so this is kind of a mystery that we're still trying to figure out is why is this here within the context of this, of this site? We also have uh, lots of oars, uh, pieces of the, the boats that would have been used to go do the whaling. Uh, and the biggest thing was that we found about a third of the hull is actually buried intact on the beach. So uh, this is about, the ship was about 142 feet long. This is about 57 feet long. So we've got nearly, you know, but uh, about a third of the ship uh, and it's kind of tilted at an angle. And so our expectation is that it's, it's more intact further to the right there. And so we plan to go back and excavate that and hopefully there'll be bulkheads and rooms and materials that we'll be able to recover um, through that excavation. And uh, so this is, we, we, we did a, a drone survey. So normally in an archeological survey, this, this is, uh, the beach is approximately two kilometers long as far as where the materials are. Uh, in the bottom there, you can see that's part of the keel of the ship uh, in that little ravine. And then the hull is actually up to the right here, um, but it's it's a huge site, and so normally that would take you, it would take us weeks to record this uh, and map it. But we were able to use um, 
what's called a, a orthomosaic or photomosaic, uh, where you take a whole bunch of pictures using a drone and then you stitch them all together. And that made us our digital map, basically, so that we were able to accomplish in two days what would have taken probably two weeks. Um, and so using using new technologies. So that's that's kind of what we did in 2019. Uh, we also found the only painting um, that's been done of the ship. So this is a contemporaneous painting that uh, ended up in Pennsylvania for some reason, uh, but we were able to track it down and uh, through, uh, through a private benefactor, uh, we purchased it. And what's useful about this is we're able to use it because it's the only actual detailed description of the ship. We're able to use it to kind of confirm some of the materials that we found so you can see on the bowsprit, which is the front of the ship there, there's all of the ornamentation. Uh, and then it kind of matches with the materials that we've found. So we can use this to kind of verify some of the, some of the materials, some of the, the way that the ship was rigged, um, the, uh, the pieces of the mast, the pieces of the bowsprit, uh, the boats, we can kind of use it to confirm. And then it builds into the historical record. So what's next for the project? Well, hopefully um, this year we were planning on going uh, back up in August and obviously that's changed um, because the, we don't want to jeopardize Northern communities by introducing foreign um, entities with coronavirus potentially uh, into the North. So we have canceled our field trip uh, for this season uh, in August, but we're looking to next year and we will hopefully be on the vessel on the left hand side. There's the uh, research vessel David Thompson, which is a uh, Parks Canada vessel. So it's the ship that is going up and taking the Parks Canada archaeologists up to investigate the uh, Franklin ships, the Erebus and the Terror. So the plan is, as we've discussed with them, is that they'll sail up because it, 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 um, births in Prescott uh, in the St. Lawrence River um, outside kind of near Ottawa and they sail it up every year and they have to go back Baffin Island to get up to the Franklin ships so hopefully what we'll do uh, as we've discussed with them is they'll just go by our site and we'll hang out for hopefully 10 days and um, and then conduct some underwater reconnaissance and and ex excavate the hull so here you see um, this is uh, what, what it would be like to be underwater and recording a lot of this material. Um, and um, yeah, that's the plan. So hopefully, hopefully next year, August, we'll get back up there and continue to um, do this work and yeah, record the ship. Fantastic. Michael, that was amazing. We, I mean, we've never had anything quite like that on the program. And that was as cool as, I, you know, I have to be professional and not ask you all the questions myself. Uh, we've got people clapping. Fantastic. Thanks, <laughs> Merges. Um, so, yes, we've got a bunch of people joining uh, live uh, on screen with us. So I really look forward to your questions. Connor in Miss Michael's class has already figured out the raise your hand function in Zoom. So that's fantastic. If you do that, I'll come and take your question. Uh, Merch family, I'll come to you guys as well, and we'll take some YouTube questions. But first, as you guys are figuring that all out and getting your questions ready, I'm going to pass along a question from the Young family, who's been joining us for dozens of sessions in the last few weeks, uh, Michael, and that is, what is your favorite part of your job, if you can possibly narrow that down? <laughs> uh, it's, it, I, I think uh, it is absolutely incredible when you find something and you excavate it and you pull it out of the ground and you realize that you are the first person to have touched that or or looked at it since since it was buried you know whether it's whether it's uh 100 years or i mean i've i've found arrowheads here in alberta that are thousands of years old and you know to be the first person to touch that and and examine it since you know for a thousand years it's it's incredible fantastic um it's something that we come to in a lot of our presentations whether it's people seeing images for the first time or actually holding stuff and again this is one of our first ever historical sessions that's such a 
Great answer. Thank you for that. Um, all right, let's go to the merches. Uh, I'm going to go to you guys, uh, our family joining us today from Fishers, Indiana. If you guys have a question, come on up. Go ahead. Um, when you say you, when you're looking for historic, like perfect lines in the water, are you looking for imprints that maybe anchors were made into the coral or are you looking for things in the water? It's, it's anything that's on the seabed that's not uh, natural looking. So it, it could be that it's embed in the sand um, or it could be that it's in a coral. Uh, anything that's once it's buried in the water, um, it starts to accumulate coral or it accumulates what's called concretions, which are like metal that attaches to it. But it's that, that um, yeah, nothing in nature really is a straight line or a right angle or a perfect circle. And so that's kind of how we, we hunt for things, basically. Yeah, awesome. Great question, guys. All right, I'm going to go to Connor in Miss Michael's group. Uh, again, they're going joining us from Glendew, Illinois. So, Connor, I'm going to lower your Zoom in. You just need to demute your mic. Yeah, I did, yeah, I did. Perfect. Go for it, man. <laughs> so, I. I heard a story like this, and the really things I was thinking about, since you guys explore underwater and yeah. stuff, I was thinking, if if the ship is going off in sea and stuff, it needs to be, I'm wondering, like, there's always a way to tell how, what type of wood it is. And I'm wondering that because that probably could have, counted into you know, how did it crash because if it if it was made with like bamboo wood which is lightweight easy but easily breakable if it was like a trade ship i could say, think if it did have the barrel i think it would ma be made out of a thin wood but strong enough to keep trade stuff because obviously it would be going out for trading but if it had a barrel, I think it would be made of thick wood. Does any t because I remember hearing some kind of wood test. If you drop yeah. a metal ball from this height, how much would it get an indent? In how long would it take to indent? How much pressure? And I'm thinking, huh. So if a pencil has very heavy, weak, and other stuff have stronger wood. How did the ship sink? Because the wood has to be something with yeah. it. You can't just say, oh, it sank because <laughs> there was too much weight. There was a leak. Connor, Connor, thanks. Sorry. Thanks, man. We're gonna, we're gonna ask Michael about the wood. We're gonna ask him about what the ship might have been made of, okay? Sorry, I Perfect. just really like it. Thanks, Science. Man. All it's right. Okay. Yeah. So um, the ship was, we think it's probably was made of oak, um, would have been the hull. And you're right, there's, there's different ships made out of uh, bamboo. And um, they're, those are usually in the uh, kind of um, eastern area. So like in the Southeast Pacific, they make their ships out of bamboo and papyrus. Um, but they probably used oak. And they probably used um, birch for the for the the masts. And one of the things that we're going to do when we get back up there is we're going to sample it. So we're going to do what's called dendrochronology. Um, so we're going to basically cut a piece of the of the uh, hull and a piece of the uh, mast, and then we'll take it back down to the lab. And when we section it we can view it under a microscope and we can figure out not only what kind of wood it is but potentially where it came from so one of the things that i'm really interested in is uh, at this time in history a lot of the ships had already been built because of the napoleonic war uh, had basically taken all the wood out of germany and england and france and built all these ships and so there was there there wasn't a lot of these really big trees that you need to build these ships and so I, my hypothesis is that the, sh the, the timber that made this ship probably actually came from Canada um, because at this point we were sending a lot of timber to, uh, to 
Europe for shipbuilding. That's why um, that's why Ottawa exists as a as a city. Ottawa was originally called Bytown, um, and it was a crux of the the area where we were sending timber from north uh, northern Ontario down through the Great Lakes, uh, and then uh, it got to the St. Lawrence via Ottawa, and then it would get shipped out to to Europe. Uh, and so I, I kind of think probably that the wood that was used to build this ship came from Canada and now it's back in Canada. <laughs> Fantastic. I think we can all agree that we'd all like Michael as our history teacher at any level of schooling. That was awesome. Um, all right, I'm gonna go to Riley. Uh, if you still have your question, come on up and uh, yeah, go for it. Okay, so we were wondering, um, what was the most interesting thing that you saw or found? <laughs> no pressure. Oh, uh, I really liked finding those carvings because we had no idea that whaling boats actually had carvings on them. Um, we thought they were just, you know, very, very simple ships. So finding those carvings was really cool. Um, not related to the site, the other thing that I saw that was really, really interesting was uh, a lot of polar bears. Um, so we had about, uh, we had five polar bears that were just kind of lurking around that kept on, uh, kept on coming and sniffing around as we were up there. And uh, I had never seen a polar bear that close. And uh, <laughs> that was, uh, that was interesting. <laughs> I bet. This is like, the story has everything. It's got like super high tech stuff. It's got like old charts and maps. It's got like epic timeline exploration. And now we've got like super predators. This is fantastic. <laughs> uh, all we need is aliens and we are totally covered for the movie. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, there's a question from a group online. Kinley wants to know, there's small cards you put next to some of the pieces, some of the items you put next to the pieces. Why are those there? So those are, uh, those are measurement cards. And, and you can see in the, the one photo with the... Um, with the hull, there's a big stick like with multiple different colors. So we use those when we take the photos so that afterwards when we're analyzing materials, um, we can get a sense of how big they are. So that, that it's called a photo scale. So the one that was in uh, with the hull, uh, with the, it, was, it went gray, orange, gray, orange. So each section of that was 50 centimeters. So one gray section and an orange section is one meter. And then we just put them together to make uh, how, however long we need it to be. Uh, and then the little card had the, the centimeters all spaced out on it. So we use it to understand afterwards when we photograph something, kind of we can measure it on the computer basically. Fantastic, all right. We're gonna take a couple more questions. I'm gonna go back to the merches. If you guys have another one, come on up. Um, I kind of, I've wanted to be a marine biologist for a while. <laughs> How long has it taken you to accumulate enough knowledge to be like a master in your profession and actually go out to sea and um, look at artifacts and kind of be kind of be known as a master in your profession? Yeah. Oh, good question. Um, I uh, there there's two sides to it because um, especially with marine biology as well um same as underwater archaeology there's the there's the the learning that you have to do on land um the reading the research uh, and then there's all the dive training uh and so it's it took me um over a number of years uh i spent before i was considered a a master scuba diver um and uh, had my commercial license and everything like that. Uh, I probably spent about 200 hours underwater. Um, at this point, uh, to, at this point, with all the work that I've done, I've I've basically spent the equivalent of uh, almost eight months underwater. So I've spent a few thousand hours underwater. Fantastic. I want to stress too for marine biologists, marine archaeologists, uh, in like you know, wannabes, um, you can start scuba diving at 10 years old. So if you're 10, you can get on the path to getting scuba certification. And I really encourage you to do that. I'm sure Dr. Maloney would agree. It's one of the coolest things you can do in your entire life. So you can out. do, you can do, you can, you can start uh, accompanied at 10. Uh, you can be certified at 12. Fantastic. Super cool. All right. 
We're going to take uh, one more quick question before we're wrapping up. So Charlie joining us in Ottawa wants to know, what made you have the idea of going to explore the boats? You, you talk about getting these documents at the beginning, but like, what was the drive to say, like, look, this is cool. We can actually do this. What sends you out there? Uh, just like, I mean, no one's, no one's ever found a whaling shipwreck in the Canadian Arctic. And we had evidence to try and do that. And it's, I mean, most of the, most of the ships, the historic ships that we know of in the Arctic that wrecked, they always get crushed in ice and it's usually in deep water because they're trying to sail through a lead, uh, which is a split in the ice. And then it basically, everything becomes match sticks and just falls to the sea floor. And it's, you know, hundreds of meters down. And so just when this document, uh, it was just kind of a funny uh, coincidence that this document kind of popped up when Matt was doing his, um, his environmental research and uh all of a sudden there was just this this is the only one that i've ever heard of that was accessible like that it was close to shore that it was in an area that we could actually pin down because you know we had a five kilometer square search grid but that's that takes weeks to actually do the search normally uh and so we were able to pinpoint it down to a few hundred meters and that's just really rare so as soon as we had all of this information it was just like well this is this is crazy opportunity we gotta we gotta jump on this can't say no yeah well, awesome that's so cool um before we wrap up Adriana, you mentioned this parks canada ship that's going to the franklin expedition ships and so i mean everyone here on youtube live i mean people have been super keen on all the stuff you've been talking about and so can you explain a little bit about this other discovery that was made a few years back so we can encourage people just to get into this field a little bit more in general? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so um, the Franklin Expedition was a famous Arctic expedition to try and find the route through the Northwest Passage. Um, and the ships were lost, uh, everybody died. Um, and uh, so it's, it's one of these pieces of history where we don't really know, we don't know a lot about what happened. Uh, and so Parks Canada ha ha had been searching for these ships for well, the better part of 10 years and uh, found the HMS Erebus, which was one of the ships in um, 2014, and then HMS Terror a couple of years later. And so now they're going up and doing excavations. And the really cool thing about that project is our, our ship crashed on a reef and really broke up. And you can see there's portions of the hull on the beach and we're looking for what's left on on uh, underwater. Um, the Sh Franklin ships, and I, I would certainly encourage anyone who's interested to go look into it. They're they're incredibly well preserved. Like it's like the the ships just kind of sank and then just plunked down on the sea. And um, there there's window panes that are still on the captain's um, cabin, and they've got uh, boxes in them with uh, hopefully. Uh, sealed containers that we'd be able to pull out and learn uh, about um, about uh, what happened because we just don't know uh, and so it's a phenomenal project it's an amazing story and uh, yeah I definitely encourage anyone to to look into it amazing Dr. Maloney this has like been one of the coolest presentations I've ever been a part of and I think that you know everyone who's with us here today feels the same thing uh, so what we do at the end of every session is I'm going to demute everyone's microphone that's joining us live. And so all of Ms. Michael's students and the merchants, if you guys want to demute your microphones and join me and say a huge thank you to Dr. Maloney for joining us today in Calgary, uh, go right ahead. You guys are good to go. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you today. so much. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. My pleasure. We really appreciate all you guys joining us from across the U.S. today. Uh, for everyone on YouTube, too, thanks so much. Do continue to check out our sessions on YouTube. We're going to be doing more stories following up on this project and the Arctic Institute of North America with Dr. Maloney and some of his colleagues over the coming weeks. So we encourage you to check that out, too. And uh, subscribe to us on YouTube. Join us on social media. Donate if you like what we're doing with digital education. We really appreciate you tuning in. Dr. Maloney, thank you so much for joining us today. What a fantastic presentation. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, all right, everyone. I'll turn to another broadcast. For